Warning, this episode contains brain food that will lead to improved emotional and social intelligence. Thanks for tuning in to Harvesting Happiness today for a healthy serving of consciously prepared brain food. This is Lisa cypress Cayman, your host. For more than 13 years, I've been handcrafting these sound ideas for better well-being. Each week, I love spotlighting diverse thinkers and doers who are contemporary trendsetters and change agents devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. I invite you to listen up and change the way you think about human happiness. Our award-winning content is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven media that promotes well-being from the inside out. Alrighty then, let's dive in. This episode offers psychosocial education designed to inspire and motivate our listeners. The information provided does not constitute a therapeutic relationship nor a substitute for professional mental health care. If you are experiencing a mental health crisis, call 911, go to your nearest emergency room, or for listeners in the United States, text 988 for the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Thanks for joining me on today's show, where we will be talking about the truth be told, disinformation, denialism, and protecting our precious democracy. My guest today is Dr. Lee McIntyre. Lee McIntyre is a research fellow at the Center for Philosophy and History of Science at Boston University. He's also a former instructor in ethics at Harvard Extension School. Lee holds a BA from Wesleyan University and a PhD in philosophy from the University of Michigan, formerly executive director of the Institute for Quantitative Social Science at Harvard University. Lee has also served as a policy advisor to the executive dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard and as associate editor in the research department of the Federal Reserve Bank in Boston. Lee has been on the show before, and I'm so eager to talk with him about his latest book on disinformation, How to Fight for Truth and Protect Democracy. Lee, thanks for joining me again on the show. Thanks for having me back. Oh, I'm super excited to talk with you about this subject. <laughs> Let's talk about what the inspiration for writing this book, because I think that's really important. And then maybe talk a little bit about the origins of disinformation and the subtleties between misinformation, disinformation, and denialism. Yeah, I, I'm a scholar. I'm a philosopher of science, and I've been writing about science denial for many years, which is what I think we talked about when I was on the last time. And then I started to see the pathway that the science deniers were using um, recapitulate itself at the national level for all facts, which I, I don't call that science denial. I call that reality denial. January 6th really woke me up because I realized that this uh, disease, if you want to think of it that way, was not just endangering science, but also democracy. And so that's where the book came from, because it was the same blueprint, the same pathway, um, sometimes the same sorts of players. And that's what really, uh, you know, made me want to do it. I can't remember the second thing you wanted me to cover. Oh, that's okay. First of all, I'm really glad that you did do it. I'm really glad that you did write this book because it's it's timely for all of us as a wake up call. But the second part of my question was to describe the differences between disinformation, denialism, and misinformation. It's, it's a good question. It took me a while to, to make sure to get that one right. Misinformation is an accident, but disinformation is a lie. So misinformation is when you make a mistake. You might believe something for uh, you know, whatever reason that turns out to be false, um, but and you might even share it with other people, but you might also revise your belief later on. Disinformation is false information that's created by someone intentionally because they not only want you to believe that falsehood is true, they want to polarize you around a factual issue. So they want to make you uh, somebody who's on their team so that you begin to not trust people who are on the other side, somebody who's maybe going to try to correct you on that. Uh, on that fact. And this is the really interesting part where denial comes into it. Because I'd been thinking about denial for quite some time, talking about what it was, how to fight back, etc. And then I realized that denialists didn't just wake up one day wondering 
whether there were microchips in their vaccines. They're created by disinformation. <laughs> I mean, yeah. disinformation is the pipeline that leads to denial. And that happens for both science denial and for reality denial. That, and that was the second reason why I wanted to write this book, because it was like I had one piece already in my hand and this other piece I saw and I wanted to put them together. It's a short book, but it's the last piece of the puzzle. I want to talk about the origins of disinformation because people might not be aware of this. And there's an interesting history of how disinformation yes. was used in politics and marketing and how it was wildly successful. Yes. So lying has probably been around as long as human speech. Disinformation is a little bit bigger thing than just lying. So disinformation is a kind of warfare. And this, you can really trace the uh, modern information warfare back to Russia in the 1920s. Um, the word disinformation was, is actually from a, a, a Russian root, a Russian word, which I'm not going to try to repeat here because my accent is terrible. But it was invented by uh, V.I. Lenin um, as, as a means to fight back the counter-revolutionaries just after the Russian Revolution. And he appointed uh, Felix Derzhensky as the head of the Cheka. And a lot of the tactics that they used, you know, quite successfully in that information war were then adopted in the Soviet Union and then adopted again in Russia, where people forget Putin was a KGB officer in uh, in East Germany. He, he knew these tactics very well. So that's one root of what's going on today, that information warfare, disinformation has been around as a, a modern technique for about 100 years. There's another strand here, which is that in 1953, the heads of the major tobacco companies came together in the Plaza Hotel in New York City to try to figure out what to do about this forthcoming study that was going to show a causal link between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. And they had a public relations expert in there to advise them what to do. And he said, fight the science. And he didn't mean fight it scientifically, he meant through public relations. And I remember reading in a, a handbook on uh, information warfare, the, the very funny line, I wish I could quote it exactly, it said that in some ways there was not a very um, bright line between marketing and information warfare. So if yeah. you think about it, what the public relations person was really doing was advising them to take something that wasn't true and create doubt around it. Uh, you know, share false information, get the public relations out there. So it was a kind of information warfare. And that pathway, the tobacco strategy, uh, people in the field call it, led to decades of science denial about vaccines, about climate denial. And it has now also led to January 6th. And when we talk about uh, disinformation about science that comes from Russia, I want to just go back to what you were saying about denial of AIDS, climate, vaccine, all of that emanated originally from Russian propaganda. Yeah, some of it didn't perhaps originally start with Russia, but what they're good at doing is amplifying, you know, things that, that they find elsewhere. And in some cases, it did start in Russia. People don't realize that, uh, I mean, people know from the Mueller report that, you uh, the Russians have targeted our democracy and shared disinformation to try to undermine that institution. What they don't realize is that we've been in an information war about American science for about the last 20 years with Russia, even back further than that, back to HIV AIDS. Um, back mm. to, I mean, there, there were, you can trace uh, Russians trying to undermine Western confidence in science back even before Putin. The most recent example of this, this is just an unbelievable thing. You know, I mentioned before about the um, microchips in the vaccines. Everybody's heard of that. They yes. don't know that that came from a Russian troll farm. That was uh, first published in the Oriental Review, um, in which is an English language propaganda arm of the SVR, which is what used to be the KGB. And it said in April 2020, um, any future vaccines developed in the West will have tracking microchips in them, courtesy of Bill Gates, who holds patent 666 on this technology. <laughs> share, share on Facebook, share on Twitter. 
By the next month, 28% of Americans thought there was something to this. So this was a wildly successful disinformation campaign uh, to undermine you know, American science and the stability of our democracy all at the same time. And people have no idea where it came from, but that's where. And it's important to recognize that as a consumer, as an American citizen, as a citizen of the world, forget even here in the United States, that we don't often recognize the signs of these materials when they infiltrate our social media feeds or even the mass media. Right. It's very yeah, subtle. Right. It gets in there and it's a worm and it just that's right. It infests. It, it's designed to exploit your cognitive weaknesses, one of which is this cognitive bias to look for information that backs up what you already want to believe is true. And for some folks, they were already suspicious about vaccines. And so when they heard, oh, you mean there might be microchips in the vaccines? That just sounds terrible. I mean, for one thing, I mean, it, it's not even technically possible. I mean, how, how how is that going to work? But people were concerned about this because they were already worried about vaccines. So that was one insidious way that uh, you know the Russians got people to take it seriously. And that went viral. I mean, not that many people read the Oriental Review, but from there, it got amplified massively. And then it infiltrates to more common outlets is what you're saying. It starts maybe Face, in, a, in an obscure place. Yeah, in, a, in an obscure place and then finds its way. Yeah. And you can never trace the actual origins of this stuff. Well, you can. It just happened later, right? It's one of those instances where the lie gets halfway around the world, you know, before the truth can get its shoes on. And the Wall Street <laughs> Journal finally did its, um, you know, an expose of this based on work from the Defense Intelligence Agency. But nobody read it. I mean, it was never on cable news. It was in an article that was paywalled on the Wall Street Journal uh, website. And, you know, some, I don't remember who it was, I didn't invent this phrase, but some wag recently said, um, we now live in an era in which the truth is paywalled and the lies are free. Wow. And that's where we are. Because scary. the Wall Street Journal story, people didn't see it. Let's take a break. And when we come back, we will continue the conversation with Lee McIntyre. We're talking about his latest book on disinformation, how to fight the truth and protect democracy. To learn more about Lee's amazing work, please go to leemcintyrebooks.com. On Twitter, you can find him at Lee C. McIntyre and on Facebook at Lee Cameron McIntyre. Here comes the pause. We'll be right back. Hang on just a minute here. Before we take that pause, let's talk about strategies for solving life's problems and the satisfaction in finding solid solutions to those problems that come our way. Thinning hair is just one of them, and it's complicated because the problem is much bigger than our hair alone. Just like our skin, the condition of our hair reflects our overall health, and there are internal factors that can affect the way our hair looks, feels, and grows. And that's where Nutrafol can help. Nutrafol is the number one dermatologist recommended hair growth supplement with over 1 million people seeing thicker, stronger, faster growing hair with less shedding. Take their three-minute hair wellness quiz for a personalized plan that targets better hair growth through a whole body health approach. Learn what keeps you from reaching your hair potential by analyzing lifestyle, biology, hair history, and environmental triggers. Nutrafol has five formulas that are tailored to your hair's needs to help you achieve visibly thicker, stronger, faster growing hair in three to six months. Each physician formulated product is drug free and made with high quality ingredients that are recommended by more than 4,500 doctors and hairstylists nationwide. I've been using Nutrafol religiously for nearly two years. My hair is thicker and healthier because of Nutrafol, and remarkable side benefits include better sleep, improved stress response, and a significant reduction in those pesky menopause symptoms, including hot flashes. No matter your lifestyle or stage of life, Nutrafol is a great solution that targets the root causes of thinning and supports hair growth from within. 
Simplify your self-care with easy online purchasing, no prescriptions or doctor visits required. Free shipping and automated deliveries ensure you'll never miss a day. Join me and more than a million others who are committed to keep growing with Nutrafol. Start your hair growth journey today by taking Nutrafol's hair wellness quiz and get your personalized hair plan today. For a limited time, Nutrafol is offering our listeners $10 off your first month subscription and free shipping at Nutrafol.com slash quiz when you enter the promo code HARVESTING. Take the quiz and get started on reaching your hair wellness goals with Nutrafol today. Nutrafol.com spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L dot com slash quiz promo code HARVESTING. That's Nutrafol.com slash quiz promo code HARVESTING. Now let's take that pause. Research tells us that happiness is good for our health. Happy people live longer, are more productive, and make better partners, parents, and professionals. Want more sound ideas for better well-being? Check out our new bonus edition content, More Mental Fitness by Harvesting Happiness, available exclusively on Medium and Substack. One thing I know for certain, happiness waits for no one, and at times we all need a little support. To learn more about lifestyle management and mental fitness consulting services, please visit HarvestingHappiness.com. And we're back, continuing the conversation with my guest today, Dr. Lee McIntyre. We're talking about truth be told, disinformation, denialism, and protecting our precious democracy. Let's get back to it. Lee, prior to the break, you said something that really caught my attention and should get everybody's attention about the truth being held behind a paywall, right? That the lies are free and the truth we don't have access to without paying for it. Yeah, it's a scary thing, isn't it? Because when people go looking for something on social media, uh, it's very frustrating when you see something that's paywalled. I mean, how hard are you going to work to you know see if you can get around the paywall, look at it? But this information, they make it easy to find. Easy to find, easy to amplify. Notice that story I was talking about on the Oriental Review. It had the yeah. links right at the bottom of the page to share it. It, you know, it, it was, yeah. they want you, uh, they have the tools all built in for the story to go viral. Interesting. And I want to add something about you to the conversation, and that is that you are part of the Mental Immunity Project and Circe which is the project of Andy Norman. So your work really plays into the spirit of the collective who's trying to help educate the the public on how to recognize misinformation, how to boost critical thinking, and how to question and research and suss out the truth for oneself. Yes, it's important for people to realize that they are not helpless in the face of mis- and disinformation. There are things that you can do to get better at identifying it and fighting back against it. Some of these tools are actually taught to elementary school kids in Finland. Um, but there's nothing to say that we as adults you know, can't, can't learn uh, these sorts of things. And Andy has written a terrific book called Mental Immunity. Uh, and there are now uh, workshops that we offer uh, through Circe. It's going to be one next week, in fact. If you go to my Twitter, you can find the uh, the link for it so that people can learn all about the Mental Immunity Project. And the idea is just what you said. We can learn how to defend ourselves. We can learn how to have a more robust mental immune system to recognize this stuff. And then, you know, my, my favorite part of it, too, is we, we've talked in the group about it's kind of like that moment on the plane when they say, put on your own oxygen mask before you help others around you. You've got, you know, so you can learn how to do this and then help other people do it. Um, talking to, you know, so working on yourself first, working on other people, that's important. It's not the whole of it, um, uh, the way to fight back against disinformation. There are other pieces to it that I talk about in my book, but this is one very important essential part of getting started to fight back against disinformation. You know, when I was a kid, they taught critical thinking in school. I don't believe it's taught actually as a subject matter. I was having this conversation with another Circe partner, a collaborator. And maybe in Finland, this is part of what is being taught in elementary school. You know, and these are very basic skills. The problem is we can't wait for the kids to grow up and save us. 
I right. mean, we've got to yeah. we've got to learn it ourselves. And you know, critical thinking. Yes, I mean, I'm a philosopher. Andy's a philosopher. You know, basically anything that increases the employment market for philosophers, you know, sounds good to me. <laughs> Why don't they teach more critical thinking in school? Um, but since they don't, um, the, you know, the techniques are kind of fun and easy to learn. And so that's what we're we're advocating. And, it, you know, it's also kind of empowering to learn how to do this because people don't like to be made a fool of. They don't like to yeah. be duped. And critical thinking is a kind of a mental jujitsu that, you know, helps you, you know, how to uh, how to recognize when somebody's trying to bamboozle you. And I think it just improves overall communication skills. Somebody who is is taught the basic skills of critical thinking understands how to engage in civil conversation without it getting heated, right? You know how to yes. ask these powerful open-ended questions that invite somebody to t actually tell you more, to tell you why they yeah. think the way they think. And yes, and the nice thing about it for me, thinking as a as a philosopher, as a human being really, is that the the guiding star behind critical thinking is respect for truth. Yeah. It's this idea that if you're not sharp enough in your questions, even questioning your own beliefs, you're going to miss out on true beliefs and you you might get bamboozled into things that are not true. It all goes back to Socrates. What did Socrates do? He asked these incredibly simple but important you know, uh, basic questions that led people to understand that they didn't know as much as they thought they did. That doesn't mean that knowledge is impossible. It means that you only get there through critical analysis, which is what he was after. And yes, I think I wish more people did that uh, today. Well, this is what we're hoping to uh, help get the word out of the importance of these skills and the, the joy in using them, because it does build better relationships, better connection, which at the end of the day, I think builds a stronger community and stronger society. Because right now we're so polarized on everything. I mean, it's from yeah. basic, simple things. You've got people that will uh, deny or disagree, not even because they know, but they think they know. And the oppositional position is is giving them some sort of power. If you think you know the truth in advance, then it does all sorts of terrible things. Like you just only look at the evidence that backs up what you already think. You know, you're not willing to criticize your own beliefs to see if you might be wrong. It, it it just it really poisons the way that is the way to truth. And that's a uh, you know, that that's a that's a dangerous thing. And it runs the risk of undermining society. Right. I mean, you're yes. writing about how it could affect democracy. Well, the great experiment could be over. Right. Without if we don't start thinking more critically and acting more responsibly it's a possibility that's important and i'll give you an example the disinformation in the coming election is going to be incredible off the it's charts now, i would imagine now, well it's ai assisted now yeah and so people can sometimes be blind to the times when they're being manipulated. They'll say, oh, I see how other people would be manipulated this, but I, I don't see for myself. And you've got to remember that one of the most important things that, for instance, that Russian disinformation does is it exploits existing um, cracks in American society. One of the things that they focused on, one of their, their number one target group in 2016 were African-American voters to try to keep, not to have them vote for Trump, but not to vote at all. And if mm -hmm. you look at the memes, I mean, they're laughable. They're they're terrible. They have grammatical mistakes. I mean, you look at them and think how, you know, what were they thinking? The memes are going to be better now because, as I said, they're, they're AI assisted. And we all have to be careful. When the meme or the disinformation tells you something that you sort of already wanted to believe and you find yourself reacting by going, yeah, yeah, that's right. You might be being emotionally manipulated. Be careful. Um, this happened to Bernie Sanders supporters in 2016 as well. They were another target of Russian disinformation to try to exploit the rift between Bernie Sanders and Hillary supporters so that the Bernie Sanders folks would not vote for Hillary in the general election. 
So, I mean, you can be manipulated by uh, disinformation and, and you won't even know it. So be very careful in the coming election. Well, I think if we are getting our uh, political data from memes, that's probably a, a good indication that we need to do a little bit of a, a deeper dive to verify. Yeah, but memes are so fun, aren't they? They I mean, are. They're, they're, they they're, are. They're, they're emotionally, they're, they're cute content. There's usually a joke. Um, you know, it's visual for one thing. And they're they're usually emotionally engaging. I mean, they know how to uh, pull you in exactly that, way, that right way. Memes are a very effective tool of uh, disinformation. There's a terrific book by uh, Joan Donovan, who's one of my uh, colleagues at uh, BU and one of the world's uh, leading experts on disinformation called Meme Wars, where mm. she talks about how memes are used uh, in disinformation campaigns. Scary. It's very, very scary. And it, it, it forces us to, to, to pay attention. And the question is, if we don't learn how to pay attention, we will miss it and we will be duped. That's right. That's right. And that's what you're trying to prevent. Let's talk a little bit about partisanism and how that oftentimes is the byproduct of this disinformation. Yeah, it's a point that it's so easy to miss because it's easy to understand that this information is false and that maybe that it's intentionally false. So they want to convince you of the falsehood. To take it down one more level, though, you have to realize that this the, the secondary goal of disinformation is to polarize you around a factual issue so that you are inclined to distrust or even to hate the person who's on the other side of that factual issue, which means that you're not going to listen to them right. to correct your own belief, but you're also, it poisons the path by which your future beliefs might be correct as well. So, you know, it causes us to drop into these opposing camps around a, um, around a factual issue, which again is a very dangerous thing because how do you learn the truth? You use it, you, you learn it by talking to people that you disagree with. And you really can do that and have cordial conversations yeah. if you are respectful and, and you maybe you listen to what they have to say. It really is possible. But if you're taught to hate, to you know, uh, even to think that the other side is, you know, deserving of physical violence, which you find sometimes in disinformation, then those conversations are, just don't happen. And by the way, that can polarize you even if you don't think the message the false message is true because it can make you feel like I can't even talk to those people. It's not worth my time. They're in a cult. Why should I even open my mouth? You know, yeah. but now you're polarized too, because yes. you've been convinced that you have no voice. You have no ability to talk to anybody who believes something so outlandish as, you know, whatever it is, whereas you don't, I, I went to a flat earth convention. You can talk to people who believe outlandish things and do it in a calm, dignified, respectful way, and have them listen to you. It is possible. How did it go? I'm, I'm fascinated. Well, I, I didn't convince anybody to, you know, tear off their lanyard and say what a fool I was. But I spent 48 hours having really important, in-depth conversations about why they believed what they believed, what else they believed, the conspiracy theories that led them there, the lack of trust, sometimes the personal trauma that they had undergone that led them to have a lack of trust and the harassment and bullying that they felt from their society for their flat earth beliefs, which you can, people sometimes laugh at that, but they've got kids. They've got kids who believe this and they get harassed and bullied in school. So, you know, this is why when people say to me, oh, there is no such thing. They're just goofing around. They're just trolling and you don't realize it. Nobody would fool around with that. I mean, to say nobody, some people would. The folks I met were absolutely dead serious because they'd have to be. They were kicked out of their church, out of their family. Some of them lost their job. They were victimized by this belief. They, they were, you know, in very bad shape because of it. It's interesting describing the other side of the coin. And yes. it also makes me think about the basic human needs. I mean, as, as people, That's we all pretty much want the same thing. And that is an approach that I take when I engage with somebody who has beliefs that are different from my own or are so 
wedded to some of the disinformation that's out there. That is what I tell myself. Like this person is really wants the same thing I do: safety, security, mm-hmm. a decent life, be able to you know put their kids through college, you know, travel. What whatever the average person wants, yeah. the other person wants as well. And we forget about that. Right. And that is part of the polarization technique too. To demonize yes. the other side and to forget that fear can make you do terrible things. Yes. And fear can make you hate. As we see all over the world today. And, you know, also, the, the you know, being fearful of the unknown and being driven to a group, like you're saying, a, a flat earth flat earther group or a flat earthers conference is there is a sense of belonging in community right that that person who goes to that environment feels that they can exhale that they're accepted you're exactly right i you know not very many people make that connection that you just made but that's really important because so much of belief is social yeah you know you find your community that believes what you believe And just as you said, it was, I mean, they thought I was a flat earther. The first day I kept my mouth shut, I had the lanyard on and just, you know, mixed in. Didn't (laughs) lie to them. I just wanted to hear what they said. Yeah. They they were overjoyed to meet strangers who believed what they believed because they felt persecuted on the outside. And you're right. There it's part of the the basic human need to be accepted, not to be thought a fool of, to have other people believe what you believe. It's just that their belief was so strange that you know i was i went in curious how did you what path led you there you know let's not talk about what you believe let's talk about why you believe it. how you got there i wanted to do no yeah. that really, that's what i wanted to do as a philosopher i wanted to talk about the path of reasoning that led them to their beliefs by the way it's the same path for climate deniers for anti-vaxxers their the cognitive scientists have now studied this and it's a it's a well-worn path that all of that denialist reasoning hits the same five um uh, buttons along the way. And what are they? Okay, let me make sure I can get them. <laughs> them or close all. enough. Yeah, we'll, close enough. Close enough for um, government work, air quotes. They, <laughs> they cherry pick evidence, they believe in conspiracy theories, they engage in illogical reasoning, they rely on fake experts. And they tend to think that the other side has to be perfect in their reasoning or, you know, in order to be credible. So in science denial, you might think, well, if a scientist can't prove it, then why should I believe it? So, I mean, those five steps, if you think about it, kind of fits climate denial. Yeah. And it kind of fits MAGA, too, if you think about yes. it. Yes, it fits a lot of things. And isn't, you know, I just want to go back to to science for a moment science it's it's not uh hard and fast right science is also fluid certain things are proven then more information is made known and things change as a result of new information as it's uncovered so in the case of um the pandemic and the vaccines and all of that well in the beginning nobody knew for example that wearing a mask was would really be helpful so they said don't wear the masks well, more information was uncovered and then it was made known, yes, wearing a mask covering your face does help cut down on the transmission. It wasn't that the, the people were giving false information. It just wasn't known up until that time. And yet they were accused of being a liar because they changed their mind, which is what science does. I mean, you've had you've given Constantly. a very good, you've given a very good explanation for um what's one of the great strengths of science which is the ability to change your mind in the face of future evidence. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, new evidence. But to a lay person that doesn't understand that, that that's a strength of science, all they see is, what do you mean you're not certain? What do you mean you can't prove it? Ah, I see. If you can't prove it, then there's a chance that I'm right. So, you know, so don't tell me that hydroxychloroquine doesn't work. Don't tell me that, you know, you're sure that the vaccines are safe. Here's the, the dirty secret. Science can't prove anything. Science works by a method of reasoning where you have better and better support, better and better warrant for your theory, which makes it more probably true. But because it's empirical reasoning, 
you can never, it's not geometry or logic. You can't prove that any theory is absolutely 100% correct, which sometimes gives the deniers the feeling you know, it, it, it leaves you that opportunity for doubt. Like right. back to those tobacco executives to say, oh, so you haven't proven it yet. Well, let's sell cigarettes for the next 40 years until you do prove it. But of course, you never can prove something like that. So that's a, um, you know, what, one of the pieces of critical thinking that uh, we need to learn is how science actually works. Um, because yeah. uncertainty is an important part of science. And I, you know, my big message in an earlier book was that scientists need to lean into this. They, they, and don't give any grounds for people to think that you're a liar when you change your mind. You know, when you state something that you're pretty sure of, don't say this has been proven or we're 100% sure, because that's never the case. And if it is, if you change your mind later, then trust is gone and it never comes back. Is it that minds are changed or more evidence is, is uncovered that then forces That's right. a change? That's it. And I mean, the, you know, the big examples are, you know, from the Ptolemaic to the Copernican uh, world system, uh, you, you know, when, who would have ever thought that, you know, Ptolemy was wrong? Who would ever thought that Newton was wrong when Einstein came along? I mean, there are these huge revolutions in science, times when they think, well, they've had everything figured out, but then somebody new comes along and then the field catches up. That's the, to me, I mean, I'm a philosopher of science. That's the brilliance of science. Yeah, It's this flexibility of mind to say, I believe in evidence so much that if the evidence changes, I'm going to change my mind. I think that's human reasoning at its finest. I and agree. It's, <laughs> it's rare. It's too rare. I agree. And that's what makes this work that you're doing and the, the other folks at Circe and the Mental Immunity Project so powerful and so timely. We are out of time and I want to invite our listeners to hop on over to our bonus sessions on Substack where we are exploring this topic much more deeply. Lee, thank you so much for hanging out, for sharing part of your day with me. I'm talking with Lee McIntyre. We're talking about his latest book on disinformation, how to fight for truth and protect democracy. To connect with Lee and learn more about all of his books, please go to leemcintyrebooks.com, on Twitter at Lee C. McIntyre, and on Facebook, you can find him at Lee Cameron McIntyre. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness today. This is Lisa Slippers came in on behalf of my guest, Dr. Lee McIntyre, wishing you kind thoughts, kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Please go out and rock your day and remember to be kind to one another. Want to take a deeper dive into sound ideas for better well-being? Check out our new bonus edition content, More Mental Fitness by Harvesting Happiness, available exclusively on Medium and Substack. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime, anywhere from the comfort of wherever you are. Subscribe, listen, and share hundreds of downloadable episodes from wherever you get your podcasts. Connect with and follow us on most social media channels. To learn more about lifestyle management and mental fitness consulting services, please visit HarvestingHappiness.com. Harvesting Happiness and More Mental Fitness are produced by me, Lisa Cypress Kamen, Andrea Mengeli, Robin Boyd, Andrea Daly, and the awesome team at Podfly Productions, including Eric Begay, Kimberly Beck, and Alec Guess, in collaboration with Toginet Radio, KBUU, RadioMalibu.net, and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange.